So first, I'm going to introduce our team. Um, we have a team of folks that um, work at the Nature Conservancy and um, just going to give a quick introduction. So Jim Smith is uh, the TNC Land and Fire Program Lead. He's on the call today, so if you have questions for him, um, feel free to chat with him in the window. And he is based out of Jacksonville, Florida, and been with the Nature Conservancy for over 15 years. Um, Corey Blankenship, she is going to be talking next. And um, she's a fire ecologist based out of Bend, Oregon. Um, the next person is Randy Swati. He's also on the call. Uh, Randy, wave at folks so people know who you are. And um, if you have questions for him, um, he is an ecologist based out of Marquette, Michigan, and can field any questions, especially those related to the Midwest Division. Um, Sarah Hagen is a spatial ecologist based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I don't believe she's here. She may pop in, um, but she is a master cartographer and we enjoy having her on our team. Um, Kim Hall um, is our climate ecologist. She's based at Lansing, Michigan. And many of these folks split their time with us. So um, she's also doing other things, but helps um, contribute to the land fire team um, from the climate, climate change perspective. And then finally, um, I'm Megan Dettenmeyer. I'm based out of Reno, Nevada. I'm the communications lead and um, formerly trained as a wildlife biologist. And I moonlight as a communication specialist. So um, winging it. So just a quick brief introduction. Um, this first week, we are going to hear from Corey. And she's going to kick us off um, and launch us into an exploration of state and transition simulation modeling. Um, she's going to give us a spin around a few websites that our small team has created um, as a service to you all. So um, these websites will support your work and sort of uh, provide a sort of scaffolding to frame the state and transition simulation modeling um, network. Um, the second week, we're going to hear from Leonardo Fred, who's on the call as well, um, and he is going to be talking about real-life state and transition simulation modeling applications. Um, he's also going to introduce us to the R Synchrosim R package, and uh, we understand that many of you use R, and so integrating these together um, is important, and we recognize that, and he will be um, discussing those next week. Same time, I should mention that, um, 1 p.m. Eastern. So three Wednesdays in a row, all at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then our final week, um, we're gonna be talking about um, training. So whether we're training folks um, to use state and transition modeling, you know, maybe we um, give a presentation to your team wants to understand a little bit better how to use state and transition simulation modeling. We're also gonna be talking about using these in the classroom. So we'll be having a professor um, from Grand Valley University who's gonna be talking about how she's integrated state and transition simulation modeling in her college classroom. And Randy will also be talking on that call. And um, yeah, we're, we're gonna be exploring that a little bit. So we hope that you join us for the next two um, series. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Corey and it, I'll be in the background to help um, facilitate any technical um, questions that you all may have. And also uh, if you have any questions about, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of how land fire works. So our first question is, um, what do you see on the slide? So please vote and we're gonna leave this open for the next 30 seconds. Um, so based on the morphology of these creatures, um, how many different species do you believe are, are represented? So, this is for fun. There are no right or wrong answers. <clears throat> so I can see the results in real time and I'm gonna tell you there's one that's emerging. <laughs> okay, 10 more seconds, y'all. Uh, uh, uh. I wish I could vote. I can't vote either. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. All right. Can you see them? Yeah. Um, I don't know if the rest of the audience can, yes, but 70, the rest of the audience can. okay, so 70% said one, which means we have mostly lumpers here. So the idea is this is just, you know, one question and, and for fun, but, um, 
it tells us, you know, a little bit about how you see the world and are you more inclined to lump things together or see all these fine distinctions and separate things apart. So it sounds like a lot of people on this call probably have modeling experience already and you probably know, um, you know, what type of modeler you are. But it's fun um, to think about that and think about your style and how that informs the way you work with models, whether it's state and transition models or other models. Well, um, thanks so much for being here today. Let me see if I can advance. There we go. Um, really happy to be here um, to talk about state and transition simulation modeling. Um, I have, you know, a pretty simple agenda laid out. My overall goal is to introduce state and transition simulation models in general. So we have a foundation for this webinar series going forward. And then to give you an overview of land fire state and transition simulation models in particular. So we'll start with a really quick background on what state and transition or state and transition simulation models are. And I'll distinguish those two terms. Uh, we'll talk about why you might use them very briefly. And then I'll spend a chunk of time introducing the land fire biophysical settings models. That's a library available nationwide in the US of state and transition simulation models. And then I'll share resources at the end for getting started with state and transition simulation modeling. Okay, so jumping right in, State and Transition Modeling 101, I'm going to start by giving you an example from a sagebrush system to illustrate what a State and Transition model is. So you can imagine a landscape like this. You have uh, sagebrush distributed across a large area, and you might want to define the dynamics of this system. And this is an ideal way um, to use a state and transition model. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Sorry. If um, I forgot, we have a live captioner um, today on our call. So if having the captions um, visible to you is helpful, please um, go ahead and click on the CC button on the bottom of the screen. I apologize. I forgot to mention that. So, OK. Thanks, Megan. So um, as the name implies, uh, a state and transition model includes states. And for this kind of hypothetical sagebrush system, I've defined four discrete states that you might find on the landscape. Starts with a grassland state, then goes to sage savanna, which where the um, grass is still dominant, but you have a few scattered sagebrush coming in. Then it goes to a sage steppe. Uh, state where you have co-dominance between the grass and the sage and finally your sage shrubland where the sage are really taking over. You also then um, have states. That's funny sometimes my arrow doesn't work. There we go. Or, okay so then <clears throat> you also need um, transitions to go with these states in a state and transition model. Transitions can be used to define things like growth. So here are the growth transitions associated with this sagebrush ecosystem. And you can also use them to represent things like disturbances. So fire is an important disturbance in this ecosystem. And you can define the impacts of fire with these transitions and also drought. So this is just a very basic state and transition model that describes the function of this particular sagebrush ecosystem. A really great example of this are the ecological site descriptions from NRCS, or the Natural Resource Conservation Service. I know this is a little bit blurry, I apologize, but um, Hopefully you get the idea. Um, this is a sagebrush community. Um, it's actually sandy loam. They tie their sites to soils. Um, but you can see that there is a sagebrush component here. And you can see the various states represented by the boxes and the arrows between them representing different transitions. Notice here that you don't see any numbers. It's not a numeric model. It's more conceptual. Um, and I draw that as a distinction between the land fire models, which are uh, numeric and quantitative. These are all available on, online. Um, 
And it sounds like we have some experts in ecological site descriptions on the call today, which is great. So we can um, maybe discuss those more. Um, another distinction I want to draw, again, kind of a blurry slide, but if you look at the legend for that ecological system, you can see transitions like prescribed burning, brush management, pest management. This is another difference with the land fire models, um, which I want to highlight. The ecological site descriptions include management transitions, and the land fire models don't. So there's some distinct information um, in each model set, um, but um, I would describe them as complementary. So there's something you can glean from both sets of models, similar but, but not identical. Okay, so that's a state and transition model. Now, if you add the word simulation and have a state and transition simulation model, um, that uh, means that you define the states and the transitions numerically so that they can be simulated in a stochastic or random fashion. So here you can see that the states now have an age range associated with them. So the grassland state lasts 18 years. You don't get to the sage shrubland for about 31 years. And then each of the transitions now has a number on it, and that's the probability associated with that particular transition. So at any given time step, what is the probability of this drought transition occurring or this fire transition? Um, when you simulate a model like this in software, you can project the amount of each state in each um, each state over time, and you can look at the area affected by the different transitions. For example, you might look at area burned over time. Now, land fire models are an example of state and transition simulation models. So I'm going to come back to this in more detail when we get to the section on land fire models. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about why we would use state and transition simulation models. There are a whole host of reasons, and I've grouped them into you know, five different categories here. One of the big reasons is that we want to understand landscape change. So people use these models to look at vegetation dynamics, um, to look at disturbance regimes, or in the case of land fire models, to estimate historical disturbance regimes. Uh, the models are also used for projecting future conditions. Um, along with future conditions, you might just look at current conditions or try to use the models to help you define desired conditions. A lot of people like to do scenario testing with state and transition models. You can compare different management actions. You can incorporate budgets. If you only have so much to spend, uh, that can be incorporated into the model. And you can track attributes like carbon um, or wildlife that might be associated with different states in the model. Some other examples are working with stakeholders. Um, State and transition models provide a platform for testing different ideas and in some cases developing a shared understanding of how ecosystems work. And then finally, they're really great uh, for documentation, for laying out in a clear fashion, you know, what you think you know about an ecosystem, what your assumptions are. And I know there's something else under there. I wonder if I can move this. I've got a little thing for the WebEx in the way. Um, and understanding research needs. So uh, with the Land Fire Project, where we tried to model every biophysical setting in the United States, we found out there's a lot we don't know. And so um, these types of models help us understand where more information is needed. Um, I, um, there are great examples of, I think, all of these uses of state and transition simulation models. And in some of the resources that I'll share later, there are links to examples of these types of applications if you're interested in them. And then I'm sure Leonardo will touch on some of these in his presentation next week. All right, so now let's talk about um, biophysical settings models. This is Land Fire's National Model Library, and it's a collection of over 900 state and transition simulation models. So first off, um, what is a biophysical setting? 
uh, a biophysical setting within, <clears throat> using the land fire terminology is the vegetation that may have been dominant on the landscape prior to colonization. And it's based on both the current biophysical environment and our best approximation of the historical disturbance regime. What you're seeing on the screen here are all the biophysical settings mapped across the country. There are over 500 of them. And every type that's mapped here has one or more associated state and, transi state and transition simulation models. Um, I say one or more associated models because some types are really widespread. For example, sagebrush occurs throughout the West and uh, throughout it, its extent, we have several different models to represent its ecology because things like uh, disturbance regimes vary across the system. Okay, so I'll walk through um, an example of a land fire state and transition simulation model to talk about um, how they're structured. And I'm going to stick with the sagebrush theme here and demonstrate um, the model for the Intermountain Basin's big sagebrush step. You can see that it's widely distributed across the western US, but I'm going to focus on the particular model that goes with the area that's mapped in blue here. So this is the northwest, the model that represents the northwesternmost extent of the Basin Big Sagebrush Step. So the first thing to know about a land fire biophysical settings model is that it includes a description. In fact, I should be saying land fire biophysical settings models and descriptions um, because the description is a really integral part of the model. In fact, the model really doesn't stand alone very well. It's a collection of states and transitions and numbers, and you can get a lot more information um, by reading the description document. So the first thing you see at the top of the description is the name of the system. And right below that, you see the names of the people that contributed to the model development and the description development. Landfire's models uh, were largely developed by volunteer experts around the country. So we went out and sought out experts in vegetation and fire and disturbance ecology and managers essentially anyone with uh, knowledge and experience in these ecosystems to help us build these descriptions and models. So um, below the names of the contributors, um, you find a whole host of information. You can learn about the geographic range, some of the site characteristics, uh, a detailed description of the vegetation, and so on. I won't, I'm not going to go through the entire description, um, but I do want to highlight one more section. And this is the section that describes the states. In a land fire model, it's called succession class, but it's the same thing as a state in a state and transition model. So for this particular sagebrush system, you're going to recognize some of the terminology because it's very similar to the state and transition model that I already showed. Um, you can see that there's an early development stage and uh, it's defined as grass dominated. And also there's some notes about um, disturbances. So it says severe drought kills what sagebrush may be present. Okay, so you're getting some background before you even get to opening the model. The next state uh, is a scattered sagebrush, but dominated by perennial grasses. And then there's this late development stage where the sagebrush is co-dominant. And there's also a late one closed um, that it's just off the screen here. So um, I can't, couldn't show that one, uh, but there is one more state defined. And here's a graphic demonstrating what this looks like. Um, so remember the early one all grassland state, then you get to the shrub savanna and so on. Um, you'll notice the different disturbances. There's replacement fire and something called wind weather stress. In this case, it represents drought. Um, that's a more generic term that we use to standardize the models um, across the nation. But um, the description informs us that we're really talking about drought here. It's not low down. Um, and then some other um, disturbances that we haven't talked about yet. There's an insect or disease disturbance that represents a roga moth, and then native ungulate grazing is also represented. 
I'm going to do a quick spin through this model in the software that we use. Um, let's get rid of that. This is um, the Synchrosim software package, excuse me, Synchrosim software, and I'm using the STSIM package within it. So this is the same model that I just showed that graphic for. And uh, so here's the early one grassland phase, your sage savanna, the sage steppe, and then your late shrubland state. And you can see green arrows are representing growth here, and blue arrows are representing disturbances. And you can do some fun things like if you want to filter for transitions, we haven't seen um, you know, what's the effect of, uh, actually, let's do insects and disease, insects and disease. And so you can see that the aerogamoth is targeting these sage um, states. It's not having an impact on the grassland state because the moth is going after the sagebrush. Um, and you can double click on a box and see the various transitions defined for it, as well as the annual probabilities. Um, and then, you know, there are all kinds of settings here, um, and I'm not going to go into detail, um, but what I uh, want to just show is real quick is that, you know, you can define how long you run the model, how many iterations, and then you have some choices about your output. Um, and lots of others as well. But I'll skip um, to the results, which I've already run the model so that we don't <clears throat> have to do that here. And, um, and I've graphed some of the results. So here you can see over a thousand year run, um, what is the proportion of states at the end of that run? You can see that your late shrubland phase is dominant. It represents about 33% of the landscape. Um, the grassland state might be somewhere between 15 and 20%. Um, so that, that's the distribution of states on the landscape. You can also look at the various disturbances. In this case, we see that the fire disturbances as well as the grazing are having the greatest impact on the landscape. And then you can also look at the variation over time. So here I'm graphing over time on the x-axis and the proportion of the landscape on the y-axis, how much fire is occurring. The dark blue line shows the average and then uh, the lighter blue is showing the min and max. So it's the results of the I ran 10 iterations, so it's the average and the min-max over those iterations over time. Okay, so that is um, just a little flavor for what the, <clears throat> the modeling software looks like. Let me skip ahead now and share. Okay, so now let's talk about um, how these models are used, the landfire models in particular. Um, this is the, uh, the sage, the big sagebrush step that we just looked at, and here I'm comparing reference versus current conditions. The landfire model um, is defining the reference conditions, and um, I think I forgot to say that landfire models represent a pre-colonization state. I think I said that when I defined BPS, but just to be clear, um, this represents pre-colonization conditions, which is why, whoops, which is why I'm calling it a reference um, here in this chart. And then the current is the amount on the landscape today, which is mapped with landfire data. So as we saw when we ran the model, the late one closed shrubland was the dominant state historically. And uh, today, uh, it's the open shrub step state that dominates the landscape. You can also see that there's been a loss of the shrub savanna and grassland states over time. And then also notice that a portion of the landscape has now been developed. And then a portion of the landscape is in this state that I'm calling uncharacteristic. And here that refers to exotics, um, in particular cheatgrass. Landfire also uses the state and transition models to map reference fire regimes. Here we're looking at the mean fire return interval and uh, the fire severity 
for the conterminous U.S. We also have this mapped for Alaska and Hawaii. And another use of the model set, because it's nationwide, is to use it as a baseline for tracking change across ecosystems. And these are three examples of some of the questions you could ask. Um, for example, in the dry music mix conifer forest, starting on the left here, you could look at how the age distribution has changed, reference on the left versus current on the right. And what we see is that in dry mix conifer forests, they were historically dominated by the late age class. And today there's been a shift towards younger mid serial states. Likewise with percent cover, there's been a shift from predominantly open forest in the reference condition towards a more closed forest in the current condition. Another way to look at this um, in the center panel here is for the northeastern interior dry mesic oak forest. And here we were looking at mesification. So there's a mesophytic state in this particular state and transition model, and it's kind of this light tan here. You can see in the reference state that that occupied a very small percent of the landscape, but today uh, that's really expanded. And then finally, in the central trawl grass prairie, we looked at woody encroachment and exotic species invasion. So we know there was some native shrub component with low cover in the reference condition, and that's defined in the state and transition model. Um, but what we see today is uh, that most of the landscape, which was dominated by prairie, is now in this encroached state with high cover of shrubs and uh, exotic species. Okay, now we're going to shift gears here a little bit and talk about using Landfire's biophysical settings models. And um, the key is to really understand what they are, what they represent, and we really encourage people to evaluate them and adapt them as needed for their landscape. So just a refresher, this model set um, each model does represent one vegetation type or biophysical setting, and it represents that setting in its pre-colonization state, so before modern human interference. Um, it's at the map zone scale, and I haven't shown you a picture of map zones. Um, if you're interested, I can, they're, they're online, I can bring one up later, but a map zone um, is, a, is millions of hectares in size, so fairly large. These are broad landscape scale models. That's their intended use. Um, and they represent conditions at that scale. The models are not spatial. And they are designed to represent average conditions over time. So if, if this sort of criteria, pre-colonization, broad scale, non-spatial, average conditions, if that's exactly what you want to do, then land fire models are perfect, out of the box, you know, go for it. Um, but you might uh, find yourself wanting to use these models, but your objectives are a little bit different, um, and so you could modify them. So, for example, if you're interested in um, assessing or testing different management actions, you would need to modify the land fire models because they don't include any management actions. And a really good source of information for that could be the ecological site descriptions. Um, if you want to look at desired future conditions, you need to take out into account values and um, social considerations and economic considerations. Um, for looking at the future, you may need to bring in some climate information to understand how states or transitions might change in the future. If you're not working at really broad scales, you want to refine the data um, or the models with local data. The model, um, the Synchrosim software and the state and transition or STSIM package can be used spatially, and you could use either land fire spatial data or local spatial data to run the model spatially if that's important for your questions. And then um, if you are interested in variability over time and looking at a range of conditions rather than just the average, you can use spatial and temporal functions in STSIM to do that. 
in particular, our team um, has worked together with Leonardo to develop a method for using land fire models to just define the historical range of variability. Out of the box, they represent average, but we have a method that allows you to simulate that range. Corey, um, yeah. we have a question that seems relevant, and I wouldn't normally Great. interrupt you, but how does the model account for interactions between disturbances, for example, grazing and fire? Yeah, um, it's a great question, and I will start and then see if Leonardo um, can yeah. add more information. So okay. my understanding is that at a it, uh, for a given time step, um, one disturbance uh, can occur. So you won't have, for example, um, a replacement severity fire and a mixed severity fire happening at the same time. Um, in the model, but I think there are a lot of nuanced settings that maybe Leonardo could speak to more. Yeah, sure. Um, so there are, you can actually run the model one way or the other. So as Corey said, you can set up the model so that only a single transition can happen to a cell in any one time step. But you can also set up the model so that multiple transitions, so you know, you could have grazing and fire happen in the same time step. And then there are more advanced features. I'll put a little link to the documentation of those features uh, in the chat in a minute. But there are more advanced features that allow you to sort of define how the probability of a transition is affected by what's happened to the cell in the past. So you could say, you know, if the cell's been grazed recently, the probability of fire is reduced because there's less fuel, for example. Uh, or if there's been, you know, a high... Uh, high precipitation event recently, the probability of fire increases because there's more fuel. Uh, so yeah, there's more advanced features and I'll talk a little bit more about these when we, um, when we do the session next week as well. Thanks, Leonardo. And thanks for watching the chat. I turned off some of those extra features um, so I wouldn't get distracted, Megan. So just interrupt as needed. Um, I have a few more slides and then we should have plenty of time for discussion. So um, finally, sort of the last thing I want to touch on are the resources that are available for helping you get started if you're interested to um, in state and transition simulation modeling. So first of all, at landfirereview.org, you can get all of the landfire biophysical settings, models, and descriptions. In addition to getting those data, you can get a lot of information that documents you know, what they are um, and how they can be used. We also have a complimentary website. It's called Landfire Vegetation Modeling. And if you Google that, you'll um, bring up this website. This website focuses on adapting landfire models to look at current conditions. And then it includes some information about maybe projecting out into the future, looking at climate. Um, change, and then it also covers some of the advanced options. So this is a really great place to go if you've got the basics covered, but you want to take a land fire model and do something different than reference condition modeling with it. Our team recently had a publication come out in the journal Ecosphere that provides really great documents documentation on the history and development of the land fire biophysical settings models. And it also gives a number of examples of how the models have been useful in land, land management applications. Then Apex RMS, which those are the developers of uh, STSIM and SANCRSIM, have a lot of excellent information online at our Landfire websites, we link to them, but I want to just point directly to some of the STSIM documentation that's available when you go to install the STSIM package. Um, there's a section on using STSIM here, which provides really good background information if you're new to the software or have questions. Quick refresher here, 
Stay tuned for, for parts two and three. Leonardo will be focusing on applications and R-Sync or SIM next week and some of the more advanced functions in the model that I did not cover today. And then Randy Swati and Dr. Priscilla Namai are going to talk about using state and transition simulation models in the classroom. And uh, you can contact me um, at any time if, if you have questions. And um, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'll just say that um, when I took that poll that we started with at the beginning, um, I was unable to commit uh, to an answer. That was really hard for me. So um, I think I'm undecided or I don't know, maybe that means I'm a, I'm a splitter because I just need all this detailed information to even make a call. Um, so with that, Thanks so much for being here, for taking the time, and I'd be happy to entertain questions, and I'm sure the rest of the folks on the call who are familiar with models would be as well. Thanks, Corey. Um, thanks for kicking off our mini-series um, with such a great, concise um, overview of this process. Um, feel free. We have plenty of time for questions. We have over 20 minutes. So it looks like Bill has a question. Feel free to unmute yourself. I'd love to hear your voice and hear from you. Let us know um, who you work for and um, yeah, we'll field questions. And then I'm going to launch a poll in a couple of minutes. So please take our evaluation poll, but go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thank you so much, Corey. That was great. Um, I work for the Forest Service. We call just the Forest Service Southwest Oregon. And my question is about uh, Land fire models. I've been examining land fire BPS models a lot and trying to use those as a basis to construct some more complex SD SIM models for vegetation types down here. So the question about the documentation BPS models is that I often come across, you know, I have literature that I've found that isn't included in the BPS models, and I think it would be, it's relevant literature. So I'm not just I'm not sure if the the modelers looked at those sources and decided not to use them for some reason. So it would be it would be right. nice if, if in the description if they would list the ones that they considered and didn't use. Right, uh, that is a great point. So there is a references section, which I'm sure you saw in the documentation. So you can see some, probably not all, of what was considered. Um, but there's no um, sort of formal documentation of what was considered but not used. Um, I will say that we've had a partnership with the Fire Effects Information System, and they've been fantastic at bringing in sort of the full spectrum of literature for systems that they've reviewed, and that's been enormously helpful. Um, if you find that the documentation is lacking um, or you just you need more information or maybe more current studies because the model was developed a while ago and maybe doesn't have the most current information, you can go to the Fire Effects Information System. They have something called Fire Regime Syntheses, and that kind of pairs up biophysical settings models with um, their literature searches. And um, you may find uh, more literature and just sort of like the full spectrum of literature there. Um, so that could be really helpful. Um, also, we're always happy to take feedback as you're going. Um, if you want to keep a list for us of like, you know, this really does not have the most current literature. Um, if you could even include sources, that would be great. But just, um, you know, let us know. Um, the models were developed by experts based on their knowledge and experience. And so some uh, would be really familiar with the literature and probably cite heavily, and some would be less familiar with the literature and, and maybe not cite as many different studies. So you'll find variability from system to system, and that's why um, we really emphasize taking that close look and refining as needed. Great, thanks. Yeah, so maybe I'll, well, as, a, as a first step or one of the steps, I'll just contact the lead modelers and just to say, hey, why didn't you include this literature, this literature? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And, um, you know, please, 
please loop us in so we know too we're moving towards a more continuous review process so we want to um, incorporate new literature um, or even old literature that was uh, maybe forgotten <laughs> that could be added. Great, thank you. Um, Megan, I'm seeing a question in the chat. Yeah, go for it. Okay, how did you develop the probabilities associated with each transition type? So the probabilities um, were defined by the experts who developed the model based on literature and experience, but also the process of modeling. So um, where we have the best information tended to be in, in forests um, and also for fire disturbance. We tend to have more information um, that's easily transferred into the models about fire frequency. Um, but people just uh, gleaned what they could from existing uh, literature or maybe inventory and monitoring data. And sometimes that will be very well documented in the description. Um, and sometimes it won't be documented as well. In fact, sometimes you'll see there's a section in the description called issues or problems. And you'll see statements in there for some systems like, you know, there's not a lot of literature out there. Um, it, or they'll say, you know, we made the assumption, you know, X, Y, Z to develop the insect uh, probability, that kind of thing. So I'd say first go to the description to see what information you can find there. Um, but it was the best judgment of the modelers in general. That's how we developed the probabilities. Corey, we talked about this yesterday. When did the process start with developing these BPS models? Well, let me show you. <laughs> I promise she didn't plant this question, but I, I just, really did it. <laughs> it just happened uh, to have this great timeline. This came from the publication we just put out. So um, Landfire started with a prototype back in about 2002. And so we went through a number of phases. Um, we did a rapid assessment where we expanded the model set up to uh, you know 200 and some. And then we went through a national implementation phase where we included um, Alaska and Hawaii, where we didn't previously map or model, and um, brought the model set up to 1,000. And then in about 2015, we started this remap um, and BPS model library review. And so in 2015, that was the first time we went back and revisited the models that we had made in the early 2000s. We brought in a lot of new literature, about a third of the biophysical settings got review, and we just re-released the data. Um, which is why we're hosting this webinar series to kind of raise awareness. But we've been at this uh, for, for quite a while, quite a few iterations. We've had hundreds of experts contribute to the effort to develop these and then review and improve them. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking that poll before you leave the meeting today, that would be great. If you want to move it off your screen, go ahead and drag it off. Um, Andy has a question, how do you determine whether a given plant assemblage represents a distinct ecological state rather than a more transitory, tran transitory plant community? Mm -hmm. Is this based on the strength of disturbance needed to transition the state, the duration that the state will typically persist on the landscape, or some other criteria? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm just rereading the question here so I can speak intelligently. Okay, so you're talking about the states within the systems. So for the most part, the systems were set by NatureSurf, although we did adapt to them as needed to represent biophysical settings. But within an ecological system, the definition of the states was made by the experts, and it was frequently guided by um, major uh, shifts in things like canopy cover, or when a tree reached, you know, a, a seed bearing age or kind of a mature state. So those were some of the things we looked at to try to draw distinctions between states. But I will say um, there's some judgment involved there. And I'm sure anybody um, who's worked in developing these um, or done, you know, anything ecologically, you're always drawing these lines um, uh, to try and you know, make distinctions between things where, you know, really it's more of a gray area. Um, 
something to note relative to the states in land fire models is that we did constrain modelers to defining five or fewer states. And so with our forested systems, you often won't see kind of a true old growth. And some people like to add that state um, because they just didn't have enough states to represent that. So they'll have an old state or an older, or maybe maybe it's better to just call it a mature state, but it's not necessarily an old growth state. Um, Randy, do you want to weigh in on this? I wonder if Randy Swati has more information to add. You know, honestly, Corey, I was answering another question in the chat and oh, I was yep. not tracking your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I bet no. I bet Jim or, or others or maybe Henry could as well. Yeah, now this is Jim, and I'll just weigh in and say, you know, you understand that we're using a, a discrete modeling process to simulate something that is continuous. So, you know, people end up making breaks at the best spot that they think makes sense. But they're artificial, right? These states are artificial, at least the breaks between them, where you go from early successional to shrub step, et cetera. You're really sort of making a, continue, a discontinuous break there that doesn't exist. So this is the best attempt to do that. Again, as Corey said, limiting to five boxes. We have seen models that have hundreds of states where people have actually described a system, you know, much more precisely than we have and wouldn't want you to confuse land fires implementation of SynchroSim STSim for our purposes to what STSM and SynchroSim can do in general. Because we had to create a thousand models, we made a lot of simplifying assumptions, like how many states you can have and what kind of disturbances are allowed and things like that. But you're not limited that way. So that's why we consider these sort of as a starting point for, for local operation. They, they're a place to start from if you think they're a decent reputation, a representation at a core scale, then you can use it as a starting point. But I don't think any of us would represent that this works for necessarily your small landscape outside your back door that it would not need local modification for that. So um, hopefully that helps uh, answer your question. It felt a little long, but um, if not, we'll try to add more. Thanks, Jim. I'm going to try and tackle the next question. Um, can you talk about spatial influences of the arrangement of states next to each other? Am I correct in assuming that the land fire state and transition simulation models are non-spatial without consideration of pattern across the landscape? Uh, you are correct. Um, they are not spatial models, but in STSIM, you have the ability to run spatial simulations. And uh, let's see, there's an influence arrangement of states next to each other. So in a, the way a land fire model is set up, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, there, it's just sort of abs it's an abstract landscape. We're simulating um, <clears throat> simulation cells um, to sort of get a good representation of what's happening uh, relative to the states and the transitions, but we're not looking at where they are next to each other in space and so there's nothing like contagion but i'm sure uh, leonardo will talk next week about the spatial functions um, in stsim so in in a land fire model if you've got a fire probability you know think of that as the probability of any given point on the landscape burning but it's not going to spread to your adjacent neighbor so the fact that one area might be burning more frequently doesn't impact the neighboring cells in a land fire model. Um, we had, oh, let me jump down here, one of the resources, okay. Okay, great, someone's new to state and transition modeling. Matthew, feel free to unmute yourself or I can read your question, but um, Matthew Major. Um, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. So, yeah, I'm just sort of interested in uh, where the line is. Um, in terms of scale for yeah. applicability of STMs uh, mm -hmm. and specifically like 
diving down to the local to the local restoration project level. Oh, there might be interaction there between different types of management, different scales of management. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are lots of examples that we could point you to where people have either built more detailed local models. And Bill mentioned earlier here in Region 6, the Forest Service region in the Northwest, um, there's a collection of much more detailed um, models that the Forest Service uses. Also, we have examples of where people have taken land fire models and then locally adapted them for specific management questions and tested different scenarios and looked at incorporating budgets and things like that. So I think that um, we don't have um, a set answer on, you know, what scale, um, you know, below which you, you shouldn't use the, the models. What we do is encourage people to out of the box consider them a broad scale model. And if you're going to use them at a scale finer than a map zone, we encourage you to review and uh, adapt them as needed and, and infuse more local information. And um, we try to support people who are doing that. So I'd say reach out. Um, and if you don't find information on the websites that I shared, um, I can also share some direct links. But let me just, uh, let's just do a cruise through if I can bring up the vegetation modeling website. So if you go to Landfire Vegetation Modeling. Oh, I shouldn't really browse on the fly. I know how. <laughs> It's did my other something? my other browser. Sorry, is there another question? Jim, did you have something to add? I have it in here. Uh, no, not to that question. Okay. All right. So lots of good information um, about adapting models on, on this website. And I think we also have a list of references. Um, I'll point you, if we have it on here, um, some of the work that Louis Provencher has done um, provides a really great example of adapting models for land management and a real classic, probably a good place to start for adapting land fire models for more local scale land management would be this paper by Greg Lowe um, and others. So those are some resources I think that would help. Matthew, I would say it is fair to say that our models are courts because of the number of states and the disturbances we allowed, and we did charge the modelers with average condition over an NLCD map zone. So that, that is how we would state the scale of the land fire model, which is, which is again, fairly uh, large scale, large geographies. Um, so it does require some action on your part to determine how much they represent conditions on a local landscape. We, we really can't tell you that, at least with any veracity. I'm going to jump back to a question that um, appeared earlier that I think Randy addressed in the chat, but I'll just address out loud. Is there uncertainty associated with probabilities of each transition? Uh, not in a land fire model, because we are representing average conditions over time. There is some stochastic variability in the model. Um, but, but not a lot. Um, and I will point you, since I'm on this page, to this. Um, a paper by myself and Leonardo and Jim from 2015 about um, estimating historical range of variability. So that's adding um, variation to a land fire model. And also in the recent publication that we had out in Ecosphere, we spend um, some time discussing the impacts of not including um, spatial and temporal variability in the land fire models. So that's another good place to um, get more information about that and how it affects the land fire models. We still got five minutes, so if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, um, I wanted to also, um, going back to an earlier question, someone asked about adjacency uh, of states and stuff like that. And um, I wanted to mention that land fire maps 
the states on the ground today, um, which is incredibly useful. So if you do want to do um, spatial modeling, you can get an idea of, well, you could use Landfire, Landfire Succession Class map to map where the states exist on the landscape today. Or if you have better local data, you could use that. Um, but that's one of the unique and really useful things about landfire models is that there is a map that ties every biophysical setting to a location on the ground. And we map the location of every state on the ground today. 